Right. A very good afternoon to everyone. My name is Matt Kuzkama. I'm Head of Business Strategy at E-Residency. Before introducing to, uh, to our guest today, um, I'd just like to say a couple of things. So first of all, our embassies around the world have started to work almost normally again. So those of you who have your E-Residency cards waiting for you, it might be a better time now to pick them up. Because embassies in midsummer they go on holidays partly, so it might be less opportunity then. So um, it's uh, something to think about. Um, our guest today, uh, the British e-resident Mark Isaac, really happy to have you. We had an interesting uh, event with you in Shoreditch in, uh, in February, and uh, really good to have you back. Mark has had, had a very exciting career in uh, marketing as a brand strategist, and I think you've, you've worked in across Asia, North America, and Europe. So after you you share your experience as an e-resident, I would also love to hear what you think of e-residencies of brands out of interest. But uh, I believe you've had a, your, your Estonia company also from 2017. So um, people will be definitely interested to hear how that's running. And from this year, Mark is also on the board of Erika. And Erika is an NGO created by e-residents also to advance e-residency. So we're really happy to have you contributing and happy to have you here today. So Mark, please, uh, the line is yours. And I'll stay here for questions if you people have, if you have, people have any questions to your residency team, I'll be around. Thanks a lot. That, that's great. Thank you, Max. Um, and it's great to, to be here uh, today from a very rainy um, UK. It feels, like, uh, it feels like winter has come after a long, a long summer. Um, apologies for my hair. Um, we're still in lockdown and, and, and the barbers are not opening for quite some time. Um, so what I thought I would do is just spend um, a little bit talking about my motivations uh, for, for going uh, with the residency um, and my, uh, my experience. Um, and I'll kind of interweave that with what I do. And then I think you could submit questions on the Q&A thing and we can turn to those a bit, a bit later on. Um, so um, it, it won't be any surprise. My motivation originally for um, e-residency um, was tied up in the decision by uh, Brits, so my fellow uh, electorate, to um, vote to leave the European Union. And that was back in, in early summer 2016. Um, and at that point, I'd been working um, independently for um, three years, and I had clients, and I do have clients in the US, the UK, throughout Europe, um, the Far East and, and Middle East, Pakistan. Um, so Brexit came along and I wished I could remember, it's a tribute to Matt and his team, how I found out about e-residency. I think it was an article um, in a newspaper or a magazine. And I then went to, um, went to a website. And that's the first thing you'll notice about um, anything to do with Estonia. Um, when you go to the digital properties, um, they're always very, very logical, um, um, very, um, very accurate in giving information. So I went straight to that and I was hooked, hooked straight away. And uh, it was a relatively straightforward um, um, process by which I applied. Um, for my residency and at the same time I um, used the question and answer sessions on the residency platform and selected um, the company that would help me run my company um, who then went ahead and, and did things like trademark register so that happened in tandem um, and that makes things very simple and then within a few months um, I was able to the London Embassy and pick up my residency. So that was the, the motivation was, was Brexit and my desire to make sure that I had a, a, an EU presence, an EU company in the context of the fact that we didn't know and we still don't know because Britain's in this transition phase at the moment and we still don't know how it will end up. And if I can fast forward, um, to something that happened last year, which completely justified me doing that, um, was actually working with a new client in France 
um, and I had been brought in by a good friend to help out uh, on a project, um, along with a couple of other um, British people. And the very first roadblock was, but what about Brexit? At that point, it was all still up in the air. Um, and I was able to quickly stop that conversation in terms of me, because I could say, that's not a problem. I'll invoice you from my Estonian company um, and here are the numbers, here's the VAT number, here's the company registration number. So that initial worry that I had and still do with Brexit, um, that um, it makes things potentially slightly harder for British companies um, to do business in Europe or it's the perception um, how it was cleared up completely because of your residency. That, so that was brilliant. So that, that was the, so the main motivator um, that was an answer but there's another two things um that i think came from it secondly is how it begins to change your view no matter how digitally savvy you are about actually being much more agile in terms of running a virtual company that is not tied up in a physical location um and i think you know what's happened over the last three or four months with covid will just accelerate that that belief um so despite my old age of 51 i'm i'm pretty digitally savvy and i enjoy technology but i probably established my company in a much more traditional way um and e-residency was like um a key that unlocked the door in terms of me thinking about doing different things so i'll give you another example of that um, I'd been running my company for three or four years with international clients paying into my UK bank account. So they would have to do a wire transfer, there'd be a currency conversion, it would be an overseas transfer to them. And depending on the jurisdiction that you were involved in, there could be delays and it was a hassle. Well, because I'd made the first step with e-residency, um, I'd also opened up an Estonian bank account, which Matt's will clarify later on, but um, that was the only reason I had to physically go to um, Estonia was to meet with the bank because I wanted to have a full service bank account. You could proceed without a full service bank account without any problem at all, but I wanted one. But we'll go back to those Estonian visits later on. Um, so because I changed my sort of way of looking at things, I picked it up um, on TransferWise. Um, and I've been able to establish transfer-wise accounts in every single jurisdiction that I have a client. So when I pitch for new business, um, it's quite interesting that when you're um, up against other competitors, um, there is the work that you're being judged on, and that's great. But all things being equal, then there is the hassle factor. Um, and if you're up against a sort of local uh, organization then that can count against you and I found being able to say yep I have a New York account yes I have a Hong Kong account yes I have a whatever um, as another great way of being able to show that you are you know very professional you're kind of punching above your weight and it makes life simpler um, so transfer wise has been very good so that that whole aspect of banking um, and how I manage money um, took a big leap forward with e-residency as well um, and it's definitely um, accelerated my grasp and use of um, other virtual tools so you can actually be um, be very mobile we'll go back to that in a second um, and the third sort of motivation that came later um, and I think this is accelerating is the equity you gain from being associated with um, with Estonia. Um, and that's because I think, especially the last sort of six months, it's really come of age, both because of its, now I'll get this right, it was a security council, wasn't it? So it was, it was, it was chairing um, the UN. Um, it's kind of been at the front of how the Baltic states have managed COVID in terms of, um, air corridors and common travel areas. But more than anything, um, this whole nature of e-government. Um, and what's interesting with e-residency is that when you log on securely, 
um, into the portal, you're seeing the same governmental portal that you know an Estonian resident is seeing. You don't have access to everything because you're not healthcare and that sort of thing. But in terms of checking things up, company records, filing, all that sort of thing, it's all very logical. Um, and in case it comes up as a question, Estonia is very much a three language um, country, Estonian, Russian, and, um, and English, and Finnish as well. But, but English is, I've never met anybody um, vir virtually or physically who doesn't speak great English, um, which is superb. Um, but that equity aspect's really interesting. So now you've kind of associated yourself with quite a hot country in terms of being at the sort of cutting and bleeding edge of technology. And that's been helpful as well. Um, and then also, I think the Baltics and the Scandics um, just have become a very interesting place to do business in terms of how they're perceived by the rest of the world, which is really quite interesting too. Um, it, just in terms of my sort of day to day running of, of the company, um, so it, I happen to pick Zolo as my, um, as my sort of partner. Um, but they're all very good. Um, it's got a great dashboard. Uh, again, everything is done um, is done electronically. They'll scan your mail as well if you get physical mail, um, which is a rarity anyway. Um, but the dashboard helps. The reminders help. Um, filing accounts is great. Um, it's just become a lot less hassle. And I still have a UK company, but as time has gone on, I'm running more through um, through Estonia because it just makes more sense. It's just easier um, to onboard people um, in, in that way. Um, in terms of visits to Estonia, as I say, I went there to open my bank account um, or pick up the card and just make sure they could see that I was a real person. Um, that's the other thing. A lot of probity around the program. Um, and around the banking system and around the way they do business. Um, and Matt so killed me for saying this, but I kind of call it, you know, the sort of um, the Switzerland of the North in terms of, of, of the, the equity that it has built up. Um, but um, I've been to, I think five or six times, it might be six times, I've been to uh, Tallinn, um, six times and I say apart from that uh, one time um, the rest have all been entirely voluntary just because it's a great place to visit but again there is no uh, requirement to do it but it's nice to do it um, and you'll find your clients or people who do business with are quite interested uh, so for me it, it just made um, it made sense to um, to actually to physically go there um, I think there's been absolutely ah let me give you an example of how joined up Estonia is. Um, I, I do a, as well as doing consultancy, so people pay me for my time, um, I do some digital products and I wanted to use um, PayPal for that. Um, and um, there was a couple of pieces of software that I wanted to use that needed to have a sort of geographically um, assigned telephone number. So because of two-factor authentication and security, um, PayPal in particular, they want to have a they want to have a mobile number that's in the jurisdiction of where you happen to be. Um, so that was fine. Um, and I was in Estonia anyway, and I went to pick up a little Hey you go phone um, that I could have in a little burner phone for text messages for um, two-factor authentication. Um, so I get off the plane, I'm in the mobile shop within about 10 minutes because it's a great airport and close to city centre. Um, and I'm asking the, the assistant, I want you know, a cheap plan, um, but something that allows text messages throughout the world. So she helps me. And it must have been something I said, and I mentioned a company and she went, do you have a company here? And I went, yes, I do. She went, what's the company called? So I told her a few taps on the keyboard, is this you? Yes, it is. And I ended up walking out of the store um, with a ready to use phone and SIM card and a plan that I hadn't paid for um, because it was just being invoiced straight to my company. 
So very joined up in terms of, of how you run your business. And that kind of runs through absolutely everything that you do. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's pretty much been my experience. Um, and I say it is quite a, a game changer in terms of how you look at things uh, because it is quite simple. Um, it's for, um, I'm a one person company um, and that's probably the way it works. Um, it works best um, and there's lighter plans um, if you perhaps are just a freelancer um, but it's all about kind of supporting one individual um, to kind of run a company um, in a very efficient and transparent way um, I think I'll have a little look and see if there's some questions here um, right there is one from um, John and John's asking um, have you found UK clients responding to doing business with an Estonian company? Um, yes, I think it's changed in the last two years. I think initially people assumed wrongly that Estonia was a bit like having an offshore company and it was about, it was about saving taxes or avoiding taxes. Um, but you know, that, that is not true at all. Um, um, it's a generous, if you leave your money in your company, it's not tax, there's no company corporation tax on it until you take your money out. Um, but the minute you take the money into your home jurisdiction, you're paying all the taxes. So I would say a couple of years ago, that would be the question. I think it has transformed leaps and bounds how it's perceived. And now it's quite interesting. Um, and because of GDPR, um, and just being transparent, you know, I have it on all my communications that it's a Sony company with the numbers. So, yes, if anything, it, it has changed from being people not sure about it to being neutral to I think now it's um, now it's a now it's a positive thing. And it's something that's quite interesting to people. Um, I'll just jump in very quickly. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to write in the Q&A tab. Uh, and if you have any questions, and we have plenty of time for this. I would just add a couple of things to your presentation, Mark, as well. What I really like, what he stressed that also in Shoreditch in that first event is that when you create the Estonian company, it sort of isn't such a big step away. People see it as a big event or as if you were leading the country, but it's just you, uh, a lot of e-residents in the end, they, they often have two companies. They have one for the country where they live and then they have one in Estonia for, um, for their international clients mainly. Um, about banking, it's very true. Um, most e residents choose a fintech company. A lot of the fintechs also are not really um, based in Estonia, so that they, they don't give you an Estonian IBAN as well. They give you an EU one, and the same also works with with traditional banks. That some e residents choose to, uh, or they manage to get a bank account, a traditional bank account in their country of residence instead of getting one in Estonia. But um, but LHV Bank is 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 one of our partners that has taken on a lot of e residents as well. So, so that that option will remain there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, that was very helpful. Um, let me just run a few things. So, I've been asked about how do you find the costs of running your Estonian company compared to running a UK company. Um, well, that's that's interesting. So, I I on my plan with my um, so first the e residency is, you know, a hundred euros or something. It's it's a very small amount. Um, for my hosting company, um, it's about 80 euros a month. Um, and I find them very responsive and they'll do everything on my filing for me. And when I look at how much I spend on filing accounts in the UK and all I'm getting is those accounts filed, um, it, is, um, it is much less expensive. Um, but again, I can't speak for the other um, service providers. I also find if I make a mistake um, or I've forgotten something, they're quite proactive in dropping me an email to remind me to do something. So for somebody who works on their own, I find for the first time, it feels like I've got admin assistance with me, which is, which is really helpful and good. Um, and... You know, Matt's made a really good point there because um, he was asking about, you know, there's a good question here about expenses. And um, at the moment, I kind of, you know, in my mind, 
I will attribute expenses that have been generated through projects um, that are built through uh, my Estonian company to, to Estonia. Um, and there's still some things that, um, that I'll still expense through, through, um, th through, the, U through the UK. Um, but it, it's a general, it's a fair, um, you know, it's a fair expense policy. And again, it's, it's, it's very kind of crystal clear what, what you can expense and, and what you can't, but really it's mostly what you, what you can expense in the usual way. And as time goes on, um, especially things that are, um, virtual, I put more and more of my expenses, um, through, through, through my, the sewing company because it just makes it makes much more sense because that's where the business expense is being is being incurred um but i do think that there'll come a point and i'll give you a good example um and i'm sure there are other people that are listening today that are thinking the same thing um you know having spent um a lot of time on video calls with clients, including clients who I would say traditionally were quite conservative about uh, virtual meetings and prefer face-to-face -face meetings. What I find is that they have become incredibly positive about um, having meetings via Teams or Zoom or FaceTime, whatever else. Um, so for me, that has probably pushed me towards thinking that I could be much more mobile. Um, and I think at that point, I will probably, probably cease to have two companies and we'll just have Estonia and, and do much more uh, overseas travel as well. And a lot of people like to to um, to kind of use e-residency as a cat, the catalyst for, for doing that. But yeah, a fair expense policy. I've never had anything um, questioned. Again, that you're... you're um, service provider will be very helpful on that uh, on that one um, so something what, what I see is the main advantage of having an sewing company um, as opposed to having a company in Hong Kong or Singapore for me it was wanting to have a European Union company. Um, and I think that's a big advantage. Um, and of course, clearly, you know, Brexit motivated me, but if you're also living somewhere else, um, some, some, somewhere else it's like with the European Union, it just makes things very simple. It means, you know, you, you have that European VAT number, you've got a European bank account, you've got that European company, so that single market is yours. And also, the corporation tax treatment um, in Estonia is, is very good as well. So th th there is a benefit there as you build and build and grow your grow your your company up. Um, I'll just very briefly comment on how the system works essentially. So our corporate income tax system is almost, I think it comes from early 90s when people didn't have any capital. And the idea was really to encourage people and companies to build up a lot more capital. So you're taxed at 0% until the moment that you take out dividends essentially. And if you live in Estonia or you're, or you're a digital nomad, for example, you move around, you don't have any tax residency, then you don't pay any extra personal income tax on it. But obviously, if you're based in physically in the UK or somewhere else, then you have to pay the personal income tax on it later on. And also, the system works is that the money that you do withdraw in the end, you pay a flat 20%. But if you take out dividends three years in a row, then it drops to 14%. So that's, um, yeah, that, that's briefly about the, how the system works. Yeah, that's great. So in terms of the people that have asked me questions about how does it complicate things um, with, with UK, it doesn't really, you're just simply recognizing that income, um, whether it's a dividend or it's a salary payment when it comes into the UK um, as if a client had paid for you. But I think the idea for me, as I start to, you know, I think Matt's mentioned this at the very beginning, you know, um, on, on UK clients, um, I pretty much just do all through my UK business and my international clients I put through there. Um, and the idea there is to build up that company 
um, and take and take and take less out of it. But it's not it's not complicated. Um, it's not complicated in that sense. You're just recognising that income in the usual in 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 the in the usual way, and you're not you're not there's no double taxation um, issue issue there. Um, Oh, yeah. Again, that I was asking a question about the accumulation of income elsewhere. Yeah, it's it, it's it's not an issue because it's it, it's it's held within um, an EU company and a, and a Sony entity. So until you know, I pay myself for uh, a dividend or a salary, um, that that's a company. That, that that's a that's a company. The cash is within the company. Um, and so it's not an issue for HMRC. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's um, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward in in that respect. Um, I'm being asked about tax advisors. I'm afraid I can't answer you there. People always get very interested in, in taxation, and you've got to do. You know, mine's I'm lucky. Mine's a very straightforward sort of professional services company, uh, so I'm not making anything beyond a digital product. Um, so it's um, it's kind of the whole program is kind of aimed at people um, like me rather than factory owners that are making widgets, for example. Um, that will be right. Um, somebody just asked me, how do you see business trips to clients in the EU working post-Brexit? Um, you know, despite the fact that I have set um, my company up to kind of help with Brexit, I have always remained quite optimistic about the UK's relationship with the rest of Europe. I honestly, um, I've always thought it's in the best interests of both parties for it to be pretty, pretty smooth. We've just got to uh, we've got to de defeat COVID so we can travel again. At the moment, we still have quite a lot of it. So uh, um, until that rate goes down, I, I can't visit Estonia without 14 days quarantine. But we're but we're but we're getting there. Um, I think. What's interesting is that I suspect other countries will um, try to emulate the scheme at some point. Um, and I'd be quite careful there um, because clearly e-residency in Estonia has not, it has been built from the ground up as opposed to just simply doing something because somebody else is doing it. Um, and you'll have seen something recently about the whole concept of physical um, being allowed to go on a sort of freelancer's visa to Estonia as well. So you can see that um, it's part of a, an approach that Estonia takes and that makes it a very joined up, um, a very a very joined up um, process. Somebody was asking about GDPR um, because Estonia, Matt, if you can jump in here, Estonia, is Estonia does Estonia do GDPR yet? Um, yeah, GDPR is, is is applied now. I mean, you yeah. know, there's companies already getting fines on it uh, across Europe, actually. Um, but what 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 is maybe important about GDPR in the future? Because I, I believe your prime minister has mentioned that he's he's um, he would like the UK to be out of out of GDPR scope to develop their own rules. I mean, this is what I've heard. I, I might be wrong. Um, but what 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 the opportunity here is that because GDPR is a global benchmark in this in this field, and there are many U.S. companies even who want to follow GDPR. Essentially, um, the option is that they can use the Estonian uh, like they can create like an Estonian subsidiary and to hire like this sort of one person to to make sure the entire company's GDPR compliant. And there's obviously two kinds of compliance. One is the legal one, and the other one is the customer one. Because essentially GDPR can require requires essentially that if one customer tells the company that they want all their data to be vanished vanished from the co entire database or every all the data the company has, they have to be able to do that. So there are some service providers that we have, including I believe one office, who actually offers these services. So if you want your company to be GDPR compliant, then you, in future you can also use the Estonian office to sort of bring that make that legally and practically possible yeah that's that's, that's a good a, a good answer and i think again that was one of my motivators that you know whilst i um i'm optimistic that the uk will you know they will find a way to 
you know, survive and thrive um, being an independent nation. Um, I'm also realistic enough to know that the tail won't wag the dog when it comes to best practice legislation and the way of doing business. Um, and GDPR, you know, has got a hold. So it was, it was interesting. And in many respects, it's about, it's back to that whole equity and probity thing as well. Um, it's like server location, you know, where your server is located. Um, and I felt that it was easier, it makes it much simpler to say, you know, you're part of, you're part of GDPR um, and you're kind of com fully compliant in, in the e, in, in, in EU standards because that's just a lot easier to explain to people. Uh, it just makes it very easy um, moving forward. And I think that's equally applicable if you've never been in the EU either. Um, so if you're, if you're in, in Brazil or Argentina or, um, you know, or India, that it's, it's, it's really exciting to say that, you know, I am running a company that is headquartered, you know, in Estonia uh, and it's fully compliant with all European rules and regulations and laws um, and Estonian laws. Um, and therefore, it's a very good, honest broker in that sense, I think, when doing business with somebody else as well. So it's back to that question at the very beginning when I was asked about, um, you know, do people, are people sceptical? Do they ask lots of questions about it? No, uh, not at all. Uh, and if they do, it's always a good one. And usually people thinking that you have to be in Estonia to have an Estonian company, um, or why did you pick Estonia? Um, good, let me have a quick look at some other questions. Yep, some of these things that do you need to travel periodically for business needs or can you never set foot in Estonia? Yeah, you can never set foot in Estonia uh, at all. Um, I would recommend you do go because it's a fun place to visit, but you do not need to do not need to go at all. As I say, they're only twice I had to do it, one to get a telephone, but there was a work around there, but I wanted that route and secondly um to to open up a full bank account and there's always talk about that changing as well um so yeah you do not have to to go near um to go near estonia uh, that's the that's the beauty the, the the simplicity um simplicity behind it all um and also very secure um i rarely use my physical card uh, because I'll use my uh, smart ID um, for everything, uh, which is very helpful for all my banking and access and digitally signing things. Again, everything is done through digital signatures, uh, which are all sort of best practice. Um, but the card is there, uh, that sort of physical talisman. But um, yeah, you know, your physical location, you can be, you can be absolutely anywhere and you don't have to worry about that at all um let's have a quick look just to just that touch on 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 um on opening a bank account you know you're free to open um bank accounts wherever um you know wherever you want to um but the way I looked at it is I wanted to have that, that account that was um, associated with my company. Um, and then things like PayPal and TransferWise, um, and I think Stripe now as well, they just all feed, they all feed through that. Um, and I'm not, um, I'm not um, overselling the benefits of, of the company that I work with, but when I log on to my dashboard, all those all those sources of income, all those sort of feeds from those various financial institutions, those APIs, and then it just goes straight through into into um, LHV. Um, but there's complete there's complete transparency, so it's very easy to kind of um, do everything and, and, and keep 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 track of things as well. Um, and that's back to what I was saying about it has a catalyst and it will make you look at how you do things in general. Um, so it's an opportunity. I think, I think there's a danger that some people get a residency 
um, and they will uh, put the card in the drawer um, and not use it. Um, and I have some, I have a friend who applied free res at the same time as me and did it. Um, and I made a promise to myself and I think, and it worked. And I think that's what you should do if you think about doing it. Firstly, if it doesn't work for you, then that's fine. There's nothing, there's nothing lost beyond, you know, a hundred or so euros to set it all up. So the promise I made myself was when e-residency was granted um, and I'd set the company up, the very first piece of new business I got, I did it through my e-residency company. Didn't have to do it, but I did it. Um, and it was all very easy and it worked really well. And then as time has gone on, I've, I've, I've just kept on doing that. Um, you don't have to make a big leap you know, this is not about closing down the sort of legal entities that you have all already. This is about having a, a second string to your bow that over time you may well decide becomes the becomes the main one. But I would definitely say that, you know, have a piece of business in mind that you're going to, to run through your residency and that will get your feet wet. You'll see how simple it is. Um, and uh, I think you'll find this, you know, it's an enjoyable it's an enjoyable process. And, and that's when you start to look at how you do things normally. And you'll find that perhaps they're a bit more bureaucratic and more time consuming and potentially more costly. So you'll start to look at other ways of, of, of doing things as well. Right, I'm back to questions again. Um, oh, um, somebody was saying they're, they're living in the UK, but they're moving to Toronto. Is there a problem? with changing your address, um, not at all. So if you think about it, um, your Estonian company will have an Estonian address and that's the important part um, of everything. And then if you move around the world and change telephone numbers or change residential locations, you're just having to change those um, and sort of comply by that. But th that's very straightforward and does not impact um, and does not impact um, impact your selling company. And likewise, again, you know, surprise, surprise, everything you're getting is electronic. So nothing. Now, I've had no physical piece of paper in, um, in three years of having my um, selling company. It will all be uh, via digital signatures, um, which is fantastic. Oh, I'll give you a good example. Um, I, this isn't too complicated, but it'll explain how kind of um, e residency works. So my um, my services service provider, um, they have a named entity who sits alongside me to run my company, and that's kind of how how it works. Um, and they don't have voting rights, they don't have shareholder rights, they don't get paid, um, but they have. Um, preparation rights for my for my bank account um, and those of you who do VAT it's very complicated annoying and a real bore um, and I'm always late with it and forget it in the UK um, and I remember getting a little notification from my bank to say that there was a payment had all been made up and ready to to go out with my authorization and I thought what on earth is this um, and I looked and it was a VAT payment, which had all been done already for me and it was ready for my approval. And, and that was a game changer in terms of administration for me. So um, there's lots of little things like that that are, that are done. Same with filing your annual accounts, um, all done for you. Um, and it's just about your digital um, signatures. Um, so yeah, you can be anywhere. That, that, is, that is the whole point. Um, and again, depends on your service provider. I do have a physical um, address, and if I get mail, um, it's simply opened and scanned, and it appears on your on your dashboard. But again, the whole point of that is kind of minimising that. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, there was a really good question about picking up of um, cards. 
Um, take that one, I think. I'll let Max yeah. take that and I'll have a look at the other questions now. Yeah. So first of all, you can always email the embassy where you're plan, planning to pick up your card or then the Estonian authority and ask them to keep it for longer than six months during COVID. Obviously, at the same time, if, you, if it's easy for you to pick up right now, then I encourage you to do so. Also in South Africa, we're actually planning to open a service provider. So they will, we will hopefully by the very end of this year, we'll, we'll be able to pick up cards in Johannesburg as well. Um, but uh, this still has to be technically worked out, but we've already done most of the arrangements. And so it will happen end of this year or early next year. Good. Um, and it's quite exciting picking your card up, I have to say. Um, oh, and I can, I shouldn't say this with Matt's listening, but I lost my wallet after a year and I got my replacement card really, really quickly. You know, just like anything else. Um, and what, what's been good is, you know, e-residency has been on a sort of journey as well. And, um, you know, I used to use my card a lot and have a little card reader, um, which in effect just kind of converts your your laptop, whatever, as if it's sitting in Estonia, like a VPN type thing uh, for legal purposes. Um, and then the technology kind of changed and Smart ID came along and my card just sits at home safely. Uh, and I don't, I don't carry it round about with me. Um, Sunday was asking a good question about, um, and I kind of answered it before, but it's worth saying just about the, back to that equity thing about having a company based in Estonia. Um, and I think hand on heart, I do think it's an advantage because, you know, for a, a small nation, um, it is a leader. Here's a good example. Um, I don't know if anybody who's in the US at the moment, but the US are mailing all of these um, sort of COVID checks out to people and also unemployment benefit checks. And some of these states are having to advertise for um, COBOL programmers uh, because these checks and unemployment systems in all these various states in the US are being are run by computer systems from the 70s. Um, and what COVID has done has, it's, I think it was Warren Buffett that said that it's really interesting to see when the tide goes out to who is wearing swim, swimming trunks or are not wearing swimming trunks. And COVID's done the same thing. It, it has exposed nation states and their preparedness for things. And Estonia's digital architecture and its infrastructure and the way it runs its business and its government, I think, has been really interesting. Now, I think those case studies will continue. So I think that... Um, I think the background noise to having a, uh, a Sony-based company will be will be much better, and because they're a tech leader as well, Matt. Have I got this wrong? Are, are those um, um, Starship? Is that an Estonian company or a Finnish company? Estonian, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, Estonian. So I don't know if you've seen this, but um, there's this company called Starship, and they do these sort of six or eight wheeled little white um, vehicles, robots, uh, and they've been doing a lot of testing in London and Milton Keynes, and it allows you to order things. Um, the little robot goes into the store, it's filled up, latched down, locked, drives to your house, um, and you can unlock it with your phone and you pick out the goods. Um, well, there was a company that was doing reasonably well, but potentially without a without a purpose. Now all of a sudden COVID came along, you have millions of people who are shielding and will continue to shield or just don't like the weather. And they are using um, Starship's uh, products. I think they're in the US as well, but you're kind of buying into a bit of that as well. So I think that the days of having to explain why you're in Estonia, where is Estonia, you know, what's the deal there? Um, they've gone. So I do see it as a, as a point of interest and something that's very positive. The one thing I would have to add here is that um, Estonia, I mean, we've been trying to build up our startup ecosystem for a long time. I mean, the first 
first sort of wave was people who worked in Skype initially. So a lot of them started their own things. And now we have about four uh, startups with Estonian roots and hopefully two that are near there. But actually one thing is that any e-residency company that's registered in Estonia, you can also register it as an Estonian startup. You can get it into the Estonian startup database, where we this year we reached thousand companies there. So it's in a, in a 1.3 million country. I think we have if not the highest than one of the highest per capita startups in the world. But any e-resident who has a highly innovative, um, basically business model, your your company's registered in Estonia is less than 10 years old. You can also apply to have it registered as an Estonian startup, and then it, it will be much easier for you to bring also employees from third countries and also founders from, to move here, even though for Brits, it's very easy to move to Estonia anyway, even after Brexit, so um, the <laughs> opportunity is there, yeah. No, I, I, that's good, I, I did put that as a motivation, but you know, you can see how these things are never static, um, and programs will expand and they will change um, and become more dynamic, and then we saw that a few weeks ago with this whole ability to kind of spend time actually um, um, living and working in Estonia um, is another kind of factor, I think, that's, that's, that's very positive. Um, now, somebody was asking about um, kind of virtual get-togethers and that sort of thing. Uh, and at the beginning, Matt said that I just kind of joined the board of Erica, um, and that's double E, Erica? R-I-C-A, Erica. Oh, and if you look at my LinkedIn profile, it's there. Um, and there are a number of um, sort of virtual groups that are um, that are representative of different geographies, or you can start one. So again, I think you'll find there is a big community, um, apart from just never discuss tax in my presence, because when you get e-residents together, that's all they want to talk about is tax. Um, it's the last thing I like talking about. Um, but everybody's very enthusiastic and you will find somebody that can help you as well. So have a look at Erica um, and you can join. Um, and if you're listening today and you're in the UK, we're about to do some as well. So we can do some of these, do some of these seminars and also, and also get together um, as, as well. But yeah, that's the whole point. There's a lot of, mutual mutual support that goes on as well um there's enough of us to make it um a worthwhile um a, a, a worthwhile sort of endeavor but it's small enough that it still feels like a kind of a family which is which is good so uh yeah virtual happy hours that is that sort of thing yeah definitely and again i think that um you're not going to hit problems um but if you do have a challenge or you're not sure, there's always going to be somebody that can that can kind of help that can help that can help you out. That's the the whole point. It's a very kind of friendly um, membership club in that sense. Um, right, I'm just seeing. Yeah, I, would, I would mention, yeah, we're very happy about to have our community and 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 to see it more and more lively every year. And we also have this Facebook group, e residents of Estonia, where actually people you can see people are so helpful. You, you, you post a question and you get many people actually helping and advising you. Um, I'll just mention um, also next year, we're supposed to have a festival of e-residents. So e-residency festival n near our Latitude 59 uh, event, which is the sort of a, the biggest startup event in Estonia. So you can combine those next year. We we're supposed to have it this year, but it was COVID that ruined it, of course. There were also a couple of more questions about picking up your card. You can if you whatever national you are, you can pick your card from any any of the sort of service points that offer the cards, mostly embassies of Estonia. So it doesn't matter what nationality you are. Also, there was a gentleman who asked about picking the cards in South America. Unfortunately, currently you won't have a point there, but again, end of the very end of the year, we'll have Sao Paulo. And also if you if you've ordered your card to one embassy, you can't go there for months and months. You can go somewhere else. Then you can pay the fee. I think it's seventy euros, unfortunately, and they will send the card to the other to the other service point. Good. Um, I'm just going to quickly look at my um, look at my notes. the The other thing is that um, it it definitely does um, 
make it has made me more efficient um, in, in that sense. Um, and I think it has, um, I think it definitely is a way to fast track um, how you kind of manage your business um, and um, be more efficient with kind of the administration behind it. Um, and I think it's quite exciting. Um, and it's back to what I was saying. So if you were either considering, you know, starting a company for the first time, then it's a great option. Um, but I can't stress enough that if you already have a company and you're thinking about it, then I would do it um, and start off with one of your um, one of your clients or a new client and just onboard them um, onboard them through your starting company and see how it goes. So this doesn't have to be an experiment where you spend a lot of time and energy and it doesn't work out for you. Uh, now, I would eat my hat if you don't have a good experience, but you're not having to commit everything to it. Um, and I think it will, over time, just kind of take over because it's much easier. Um, I think it depends on your service provider, but I find it really easy to kind of onboard a, onboard a new client. Um, and as I say, looking at those other sort of digital entities out there that help you run your business, it will start to change your start to change your behaviors. So this is quite a good example. Back to that whole transfer wise thing. Now that you know, e-residency was the catalyst that resulted in me changing how I got money from clients. And I would say I've increased dramatically the efficiency of how I collect money. And I would say that it is because that was the other thing. When it used to be international transfers to my UK bank, there was always mistakes, uh, there was delays, or there was numbers missing, and different countries had different things. And to be able to virtually create a, a physical uh, bank account and address in the country you're doing business, which kind of feeds straight through, um, is brilliant. And I would never have thought about doing that if it hadn't been for your residency. So I think it does get you starting to think much more digitally. Um, and then before long, you'll start to assess the processes that you're going through anyway with, with pieces of paper and think actually now I want to become much more mobile. And if if we get back to normal travel uh, patterns, um, my plan is next year is to be uh, not in the UK at all beyond visits and actually to spend some time traveling around about the world. Um, and again, you know, having that sort of physical a company kind of makes that a lot easier in terms of how that's perceived by by current clients and, and new clients as well. I would add it, it actually worked the same way for Estonians because when the holy governance was introduced, I think in the year 2000, we got similar cards, national ID cards. People didn't know what it is for, how it's going to work. And now, you know, we can't live without it because, you know, most people vote in elections online. And you can do anything online except getting married, divorced, or buying and selling property. And actually, the property part is also looked into. We're, we're starting the online notary already as well, with during the COVID time. So, um, yeah, it's worked the same way for us. Yeah, good. I'm a big fan. I'm not. I'm not even getting paid to say any of this, but it's uh, it's been good. And I think that why I'm very passionate about it today is that kind of three months of lockdown. Um, it's made me kind of think about that whole virtual reality much more um, in terms of, 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 of running a business. Um, and I think, you know, clients um, have embraced it, other service providers have embraced it. Um, and it just makes it more logical to kind of, um, to kind of go further down, down, down that route. And it definitely frees you, I think. Um, and, it's a jurisdiction that is, um, you know, it's very pro-business, which is great. Um, it's a small country that, you know, wants to, um, that wants to punch above its weight in terms of its soft power, which it's doing as well. Um, and it's renowned in terms of 
of technology um, and, and fintech and other things. So um, it's an entity that doesn't have the baggage of, let's say, other countries that are perhaps um, more polarizing. And th that's, that's, that's the other thing. And we go back to that whole Brexit conversation. I didn't want to keep on having conversations about Brexit and what it meant for the client relationship with me. Um, and I think there'll be some of you that are listening that are in countries which ebb and flow in terms of how friendly they are towards business um, depends on on the political colour of that company country. Um, and this is a great way. Hey, sure, it's only it will go through political change as well. But in terms of its its underlying uh, ethos and how it runs things, um, I think it's a very exciting um, country to kind of be aligned with, uh, which is which is good. Um, and that's back to my whole Swiss joke. You know, um, if you think about all the probity and the desirability of companies that um, like to set up in Switzerland, but that's something that's only possible um, for for a, you know incredibly wealthy and well organised and large large companies and individuals. Um, so when you're denied that, you know, I cannot think of a sort of better jurisdiction to kind of anchor your country that's within the European Union and then allows you to kind of have free access uh, from a business perspective to uh, that jurisdiction. I'll see the one more question and then... So there's some no, questions I... also on the chat part, I'm not sure you... Had oh, let's have a look there quickly. Um, oh, chat, put the glasses on. And we can we can go a couple of minutes over if it's all right. Oh, oh, I, th I think that's true. That's a great point somebody just made about. Uh, I think Neil said, you know, COVID nineteen is showing that smaller countries are handling things with much more ease. I I couldn't I couldn't agree more, um, and I think that plays plays through to kind of the property and the efficiency surrounding. It's this sounds patronising. It's not meant to be. It's like Estonia feels like it's a startup as a as a country in the good sense of the word it doesn't because it's a well it's an old country but kind of had a, a reboot in 1990 and um, in that sense it doesn't have all the baggage um that other countries like the us will have or the uk in terms of business law so everything has been written and codified in a way that kind of helps helps the individual and, and helps business so it's um it, it's it's really good in, in, in that respect. I think you're right. I think smaller company countries will be really interesting. And I think in a sort of post Brexit environment, I think a lot of this will happen. Um, I could see sort of fragmentation in some of the nation states in terms of their approach to to business as well. Uh, but in terms of something that works right now, um, it would be it would be e residency. Um, oh, something. Like, how 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 long did it set to do business? It literally. Um, so I went online to um, to to register for e-residency. So kind of the usual sort of security questions and passport, that sort of thing. Uh, and then at the same time, I'd used the e-residency portal to have a look at the different service providers that could help you. And the one I picked pretty much didn't cost anything until I invoiced my first client. Um, that might change, but there's always offers and deals. So what they did for me is they, they trademarked my company, they registered my company for me. So we looked for a name uh, and they set everything up. So by the time uh, e-residency was granted, I was good to go. So I would say if I added up um, physical time at a keyboard, setting everything up, two and a half hours at the most, and then I got my e-residency, picked my card up, and I was absolutely good to go. So it was absolutely minimal in terms of um, in terms of setup times and, and that sort of thing as well. So the amount of administration I do is is, is very low. Um, it was really easy. Um, yep, the company does open and scan and send my email, and a couple of times I had something physical that couldn't be scanned and. and my particular company have hung on, hung on for it, to, hung on to it for me, and I've picked it up on a on a on a business visit. But again, that's that's entirely up to you, and is not essential. Um, 
Oh, I think I might have. Oh, that's great. Somebody's put the Erica address up, which is good. To a dividends, that's good. Will there be slides? No, but if you email me, um, you know, questions, I can answer. And I, I can answer questions. And I did blog about your residency a little while ago, which I, I might. I'll pull that link up onto my LinkedIn profile on the top, so you can kind of kind of read that. But incredibly simple, very simple process. Um, there has been no headaches whatsoever. Um, and I think, yeah, the only thing that's stopping you doing it is you. Um, and as I say, if you do do it, don't put the card in your drawer. You know, start to start to start to it straight away. And I also think um, it's a great insurance policy as well. And for minimum cost, you can have a second company um, that you're able to transact business through, uh, which you never know when that will be helpful for you. The world seems to be a very turbulent place at the moment, and um, it's quite nice to kind of have that um, security blanket of having something else, um, an entity that I can run my business through. I think that's us. Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you, Mark, for you know, so many interesting ideas and, and a lively discussion. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I really encourage you to get in touch with our service providers, have a look at our marketplace, and you know, um, find some uh, suitable partner for you. Mark, of course, is using Zolo, which is really focusing on um, solo entrepreneurs, especially in, and freelancers, but there are some others that can deal with let's say larger companies, multi-shareholder companies, companies with more complex uh, tax questions, such as the two other big ones are one office, for example, and the residency hubs. But it, again, you can have a look. There's also a lot of knowledge on our knowledge base on our website. There's other webinars on various topics and you can always write to our support. So thanks everyone for your time. Really happy to have you and hope to have you back soon. Thank you, bye. Bye.